Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great conference, great to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I want to keep it short because I understand running uh, behind. Okay, I'm just putting my timer so it's not run over. So I'd like to talk to tell you a little bit about an effort I did recently in my group where we tried to marry systems biology and structure to arrive at you know somehow combined insights coming from these two to two uh, methods. So recently systems biology became a buzzword and a lot of, you know, it's like a new field which started and it's often uh, contrasted to standard biology. And in the sort of standard biology, when we study a system, we look at a very complex system and then for one reason or another, select one element of this, for instance, a protein, and then we isolate it and it allows us to control it very well. So we can do experiments and we can study it very deeply. Uh, and then if we try to understand how this element would tell us about the original program, we have to sort of map it back. And of course, this is a very different conference because almost every single talk uh, that deals with, with high throughput and large scale information. But, but I was recently on a meeting in my home institute and I noticed that all talks can be basically mapped to a very simple uh, all titles of all talks have the same system, name of the gene in name of the disease. So at least in, in people I talk to, this model really, really dominates. So in system biology, we try to approach a complex system from a different way. We look at high throughput techniques, which provide us in, information about all elements of the system. Then we try to combine all this information to build the network model. And then we try to simulate this model uh, to predict something about the system. So as I said, most of the talks over the last few uh, you know, days here were, were dealing with, with something which belongs more to this group. And of course, advantage of, of this is that it can be applied to very complex problems, including those which have sort of multiple causes. On the other hand, this works well only on a single cause problem. So if you have one protein which really is important for something, you can discover and analyze it this way, but it very often fails. Uh, so when you collect all this information, you get this kind of very, very complicated maps, which, which describe relations between proteins. And uh, however, it's very complicated, but they're realistic and sometimes predictive models. And there are several different uh, successes in systems biology where people really have built models which are really useful. They provide detailed prediction of how a system like this would, com would, would behave. However, when, when I was trying to learn something about systems biology and, and did some baby steps there, I noticed something strange, that all such models I have seen so far are what I call flat. So even if proteins appear there as a point, a name, a symbol, but in reality, all these proteins and all these elements in this network have three-dimensional shapes, and these shapes are very important for the function. So the question I asked myself is, how can I improve understanding of this network by somehow bringing in information about three-dimensional shapes of elements of these networks? And it sort of helped that I was a, well, a theoretical computational biologist, but I, I deal with those structures. And this is just one slide summary of, of something which you probably all know, but I want to repeat it because it's, it's so unusual in the context of genomics, that proteins actually have structures. They have unique three-dimensional structures. And on top of this, especially human proteins, often contain multiple modules. So if you look along the protein, you can cut it in one place, and this part becomes almost independent protein. 
So on average, human proteins have 2.3 modules, but especially proteins involved in regulation, and most of proteins like this are exactly the ones which are involved in diseases of multiple semi-independent entities, domains. And each of these domains have very often independent structure, so if we cut it off, we can, we can, you know, it would solve on it, it would fold on its own and would behave well in solution. And very often it has independent function. So this, for instance, is an example of a uh, sugar hydrolase or carbohydrate hydrolase. And, and it has two functions. One is binding the substrate. Another one is catalytic. So you, in some sense, you can factorize the function into two parts. And you can take this domain, move it somewhere else to another protein, and it will still bind carbohydrates. You can take this protein, you can merge it with another domain, and it would suddenly change specificity because this domain defines specificity and this domain defines uh, enzymatic function. And it seems trivial, but especially in the end of my talk, I would come back to how we can use this insight in to understand better networks, uh, and especially disease networks. So the important thing to remember is that at this point, we know structures of about 85,000 proteins. And of course, any talk on genomics, you would realize that it's immediately dwarfed by, by hundreds of millions of sequences uh, we, we know today. So one can wonder how we can use information about 80,000 proteins to understand networks which in principle can describe organisms which were never studied by, 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 structural, uh, by, by, by structural biology. So this is a question which I wanted to bring. So what can we gain by taking a, a model of the network? This is a, a, a simulation or network model which I would come back to in a moment. And what can we learn by, by putting a structure in each point? Uh, okay, this was supposed to be a dynamic question. Okay. So when we come back to this comparison between 85,000 structures and 100 million sequences, uh, the answer is yes. We know very few structures experimentally. But what helps us a lot is that protein structure is relatively conserved. So if we have a close homologue of a protein with a known structure, we can with high probability say that structures are almost identical. And when you do this, you realize that somewhere like 15% proteins in eukaryotes and around 25 proteins in bacteria can be very accurately modeled. So by accurately, I mean that it's basically as accurate as experimental error. So for these proteins, we really know what the structure is. And this is not very encouraging, because it means that if we build a model of an organism, we know on average 15% of the genes can be modeled. So our structural systems biology dies at the, before it starts, because if you can model only 15% of nodes on the network, you can't really do very much. Uh, but this is misleading in the sense that the word accurately here is highlighted. These are proteins we can really model very well. But things change if we allow tools for more distant modeling and, and what is called fold recognition, where we can very often, you know, the boundary between known and not known is not so sharp. So these are things that are very well known. And then I think just sort of very well known, somewhat known. And, and what it means is that if we go along and allow models to have be somewhat less accurate, we can actually extend this 15% to much, much farther. On the other hand, we have transmembrane proteins which have their own roles, and then we have proteins such as disordered proteins. So this completely unknown region of protein universe is actually quite small. So my estimate is somewhere between 10 and 15% of all proteins. And of course, once we move into this territory, we have to be worried about the quality of our model. And this is something we should you know, admit upright, that once you move from this area to this area, the model you know would have significant errors. On the other hand, you still have quite a good idea of how it looks like. You can assign a fold, you would know it's a beta sheet or beta protein or an alpha protein. And at least for some applications, models of quality from this area can be very useful. So with all this in mind, we decided to, to go and try to approach, to approach a small mod model system with, with these ideas. And what helped us a lot is that all this thinking was happening in the context of the high throughput structural termination uh, project, which I was involved with early on. And a few years ago, NIH decided to fund uh, or help develop automated structural termination pipelines. And that was part of the system like this called Joint Center for Structural Genomics. And over several years, we have been developing automation uh, for all the steps in protein structure determination. And actually, I was not devo developing this. I was developing the database, which collected all the data. It was a massive data management exercise. 
and we developed this JCSG database which collected information from all the steps. Uh, but as a part of it, we have learned how to solve protein structures very quickly. And in this project, our center alone solved around 1,400 protein structures. Uh, and between us and other structural genomic centers, we solved about 12,000. So we, we can show pages and pages like structures like this. And if you approach structural biology in the standard way, each of these little proteins is a story. We can go in and study individual positions. But, but from my point of view, I was interested in how many of these proteins I can use to put on my network model and get this, this global structural picture of the, of the biological network. So I think this slide sort of belongs a little bit later. But when I was showing this kind of pictures uh, of, of proteins in these rows and, and, and columns, I was struck by a similarity between this and pictures from the, from the catalog of parts, uh, where things are, are, are ordered by the number or by something else. And they, they don't really make much sense. So if you look at things like this, you still don't know what, what they do and why. And I thought that what we need to make sure, sure sense of the structures is to put them in the context. Where, where like, like in this case, when you see, show parts in, in a functional context, you would understand better why they have the shapes they do. So this is an example of how you could do it in, in, a, in, a, in a warehouse situation where suddenly you understand it is a gasket and it's round because it connects these two things. So what, what, what would be a context in which you can bring structures uh, in the same way to make, to make sense? So we thought that this is not a random collection of parts. They form a, a sustaining, self-sustaining organism. So that the context uh, would also help us to understand structures. So in this sense, we believe that, that when we combine structures and network models, it would help us to understand both. So this is what, what we came up with this funny name, Structural Systems Biology, and started to, 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 to see if we can implement it on, on a model system. And the model system we chose to work with is, is a small bacteria called Thermotoga maritima. Uh, it's a thermophilic bacteria, one of very few. Most of thermophilic organisms people study are archaea. Uh, it, it has carried the name because of, of unusual, uh, very rigid second member. So it was a, technically it's a gram-negative organism, but in most gram-negatives, the, the outer membrane is very, very thin and very fluid, and this particular organism is very rigid. So people thought it's a toga, like a, like a Roman cloak, and, and they called it thermatoga. So sequence was, it was a second organism sequenced, a second bacteria so, so, sequenced by Tiger, Tiger in 1999. It has 19, 1877 official orbs. <coughs> I put this official, sort of highlighting it because as always, it turned out that a few more, and we actually discovered some of them by analyzing the genome very accurately. And very unfortunately for us, and I would get to this later, it's not a pathogen. So NIH was not very happy that we studied something like this. Uh, but in just recently, there is some growing interest in Thermatogales, and perhaps this would be a good place to talk about it, because they are heavily involved in energy production, and some of them are known to essentially infest all oil fields. So I understand that. Uh, they're sort of pathogens of oil fields. If you, if you, you know, like people get, can get infected, also oil fields can get infected by thermatogales, and some of them actually start releasing hydrogen and, and lead to, to explosions. So apparently there's some growing interest in this, but, but honestly, I don't know too much about it. Anyway, it was picked up in a very picturesque place in Italy, uh, near Volcano Island, and it's, it's living in a, in a shallow sediment. So it's not a deep sea vent, it's a, it's a kind of a very shallow sediment. So, as I said, the genome has 1,800 orbs. We solved about 200 structures from this organism. Uh, still not, much, not enough to really build a good model. Uh, some others were solved by other groups, so together it's, it's one of the best covered organisms. But as you see, this number is still much shorter, and much smaller than the number of orbs. But what helped us a lot, as I mentioned earlier, the number of structures, actual structures from the organism not very high. But when we add things we can model or we can predict, including fault predictions, we're getting close to, to, to the number of, of all the proteins which can possibly solve from this organism. <clears throat> and at this point, we stand about 100 proteins short from a complete coverage. And of course, this is for entire organism. And what we decided to do is to try to build an, a model of the metabolic network of Thermatoga. So how to build a network model? So it's an ultimate exercise in, ex in, in integration. 
we just went to literature and started collecting all the information about this organism we could find, <coughs> picked up functions of all the genes, and started to sort of put them together and, and merge them into, into, into a uh, you know, working network where we could connect all the points and explain all the, <coughs> all the uh, functions. So this, was, this is a project mostly done by Bernard Paulson Lab, who prior pioneered this kind of, of modeling, and they, they tested a lot of these methods on E. coli, which is like a highlight of, of the best model system they worked with. So we basically learned from them and together used this same approach uh, to Tematoga. So the first 300 reactions and genes were very easy. They were well conserved between organisms. We can easily put them together. The only problem is that network built from this 300 didn't make any sense. There were holes. Uh, there were things which, which we knew this organism is doing, but our model didn't. And then we used iterative evaluation. So we built a model. We tested it, whether it works. It was missing something. We used the old method pioneered by, uh, uh, best described by, by Conan Doyle that we basically try to find the best possible solution when we eliminate everything else. And after a few weeks or months of work, we got our model. So when we had the model, we started validating it, uh, and we found that it really describes everything which is experimentally known about Thermatoga maritima. So with our model, we can describe its evolution, its behavior in, in all the experimental states it was known. It would die. With food, we know bacteria would die and would survive and produce, uh, including uh, hydrogen in specific situations. So we believe that this model at this point summarizes everything which is known about uh, Thermatoga maritima metabolism. And then we, we started looking at this 478 genes coding in, in 478 proteins, uh, and we realized that we have basically complete coverage. We have either models or experimental structures for all of them. So in this case, we achieved our goal. We had a working model which describes at least metabolism of the organism, and we had experimental or model structures for all the network, all the all the nodes on the network. Uh, and of course, what, something which is very important to remember is that our model covered 478 genes, so 1,398 were not in the model. So there's still a lot about Thermatoga we don't know. So in some sense, we can. It's a typical problem in all the modeling. We can model all that is known about Thermatoga, and we're still left over with 1,300 genes. We have no idea what they're doing. So in our hands, they are not necessary. Of course, Thermatoga is not stupid. It carries these genes for a reason, and just tells us how little we know about the functions of other genes. So we, we call it a first-generation model. And again, this was published some time ago. I gave a talk about this when I was here a few months ago, so I will just show you one slide of what we have learned from this model. And because we knew that quality of the models were not very good, we knew we couldn't, for instance, describe metabolism, we couldn't do docking. So we focused on the evolution of the network. So one of the questions we asked is, for instance, how this network have evolved? And we could compare it by, by looking at similarity between structures and position on the network. So we asked the question, if two proteins have similar function, or so if they are very close to the network, how likely it is that they would have similar functions? And again, this is a question we can answer even if our models not, were not very good. Because even if there were some errors, we could still tell that these two proteins are more similar to each other than to something else. And what we have learned was, was quite surprising, is that enzymes catalytic similar reactions are much more likely to have the same fault than enzymes catalytic adjacent reactions. So basically, there are two models of how metabolic networks can evolve. One of them is that there's an ancient enzyme which catalyzes a lot of reactions, and then it gets specialized and starts catalyzing individual reactions. But this would mean that all the position, all the neighboring enzymes should be similar. And there are some pathways which do this. But overall, the model of grabbing something which is useful and sticking it in the middle of the pathway wins by about 1,000 to 1. However, this connected model still is much higher than unrelated. So this model of, of, of enzymes splitting and, and dividing and then specializing still accounts for, for much more than just random. So these are the kind of questions we could answer with this first generation model, where some of the models, as I said, were not very good. So later we thought that Thermatoga is somewhat, it's somewhat uh, obscure organism. Not many people are studying it. So we may be more lucky when we go back to E. coli. 
So we did the same experiment in the coli for K12, the laboratory strain. Again, we modeled the entire metabolism, actually used the model, which I said is a flagship model of Bernard Paulson's group. And we managed to model about 90% of the, of, the, of the whole network. And what is else, because the E. coli is such a well-studied organism, we managed, in most cases, to model enzymes both in an upper and a hollow state. So for every node, not only we had a model, we had two models of how this enzyme looks like with the substrate and without the substrate. And this allowed us to estimate how this reaction would depend on temperature. Uh, mostly because the larger the, experiment, the, the structural change between two, two, uh, two states, the more likely this, this enzyme is, uh, is likely to be affected by temperature. Uh, so we predicted this thermal stability of most of the enzymes in the network. And then we can answer a very abstract question, which is basically why E. coli is not a thermophile? And of course, we came from Thermatoga, so uh, we sort of were used to the thermophilic bacteria, but we sort of, you know, it's a very naive question. And E. coli is not a thermophile. When you heat it to about 42 degrees, it basically dies. But what we discovered is that when we looked at how thermos, you know, enzymes affected by temperature the most, where they are distributed in the network, we have realized that they grouped in some very specific pathways. So they were not distributed uniformly around the entire network. Most of enzymes in, in E. coli were pretty thermostable, and they focused on, they concentrated in just a few pathways. So you thought, what happens if we take substrates of these pathways and add them to the, to the, to the media? Because then E. coli would not be affected by the fact that these enzymes would be denatured. And what had happened, we actually can rescue it. By adding the mixture, we can grow E. coli quite, quite effectively in 42 degrees centigrade. So we, we managed to turn E. coli into at least limited thermophile. And this was a very specific prediction we made. And it was also quite interesting that completely coincidentally, we didn't know about this when this project was happening, there was a group which was interested in direct evolution of thermophilic E. coli. They basically put the E. coli into vats and start growing it and slowly raising temperature and waited several years to see how mutations would help it to accommodate. And then they sequenced it. And we, we, we approached them to get the sequences, and it was quite interesting that most of the mutations discovered in this artificially evolving thermophilic E. coli happened in the enzymes, which we predicted to be least thermostable. So again, it was published this year in Science, and it gave us a lot of uh, you know, good feelings because we could say that, yes, bringing structures to the network can, can actually allow us to predict things which were not built into the network. Nobody ever studied questions which are so irrelevant uh, to medicine, like why E. coli is not thermostable. But as you all noticed, uh, this is the genomic medicine conference. And when we were engaging in, in experiments like this, we're sort of gently reminded that we are funded by NIH, which is National Institute of Health, and not National Institute of Thermatoga Maritima. And unfortunately for us, neither Thermatoga Maritima or K12 is a, is a, is a, uh, uh, is a pathogen. So basically we said, well, all these tools are nice, all these insights are very interesting. Can we use it somehow to something question, some questions related to, to disease? And what helped here is that I work in the Institute, which was formerly known as Lacroix Cancer Research Foundation, and 90% of my colleagues work on cancer. And they were sort of poking me all the time, you know, nice talks, very nice. Who cares about Tamataga Maritima? Can you tell us something which would be useful to us? So when I talked to them, they told me, well, look, there are some databases recently released, such as, for instance, Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia, Genomics and Drug Sensitivity uh, in Cancer Database. Uh, and they give a lot of data. They give a lot of data about proteins, relations with proteins. Can you use this kind of insight to help us understand something about this data other people have not? So we focused on this cancer cell line encyclopedia. And, and again, this is a published uh, paper in Nature. They, they tested 427 cancer cell lines. They run them against 24 anti-cancer compounds. They, they sequenced all these cell lines and identified mutations in about 1,700 genes, and they classified them all by how they react to these drugs. So that they, they, they basically 
checked whether, whether given cell lines are more or less sensitive to this, this cancer drug. And this was all released publicly. And then they, they analyzed this data and identified multiple mutations and gene biomarkers in cancer response, you know, response to drugs. So they found that certain genes, uh, when mutated, would increase sensitivity of the cell line to, to, to this given drug or would decrease it. But well, what can we gain if we come in with our understanding of structures and try to analyze this data? So if you look at this analysis, it was clear that they had two problems. So, of course, we know that some specific mutations are very important, but in this particular statistics, these mutations were extremely spread out. So out of about 42,000 mutations they identified, only 600 were, were, were seen in more than two, actually there's a mistake, more than two different cell lines. So basically all mutations were unique. So there were only two or three mutations, individual mutations, which they identify as biomarkers of sensitivity. So what they did, they switched back to gene level, which is a usual method of analysis. And even if I hear talks given here, everybody talks about genes, like pro-gene, pro-cancer pro, you know, pro genes, anti-cancer genes, gene biomarkers. So it's obvious that in genomics, not surprisingly, a gene is a unit which everybody talks about. But if you look at genes, as we discussed it earlier, codes for proteins, and proteins have domains, you can naturally look back on the gene and say, well, there are domains in genes or regions. Regions in this gene code for this domain, region in that gene code for another domain. So could we learn something from it? And obviously we know that not all mutations are the same. Right? So there are very specific well-known cases where identical you know, mutations in, in the same protein would have opposite effect. So for instance, this mutation which gives resistance to this, to this drug, on the other hand, it's increased sensitivity. So we said, well, can we gain something by bringing structure to the picture? and look at, at, uh, at all this data, remembering that genes are not ultimate units. We can sort of increase the, 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 uh, the sensitivity or the, the accuracy of our approach and get somewhat halfway between these this mutations that are too spread out and genes which possibly are too big. So by doing this, we found a lot of interesting things. It sort of worked. So the first thing we noticed is that there were some genes, like this one, where if you look at the gene level, entire, entire gene, there was a signal there, but was drowning in the, in the random number of mutations which didn't make any, any effect. So if you look at the whole gene correlation with, uh, with sensitivity to a drug, it would not be statistically significant. But this gene has two domain, domains, and when we separately ask the question, is this domain related? or mutations in this domain are related to sensitivity to, drug, to the drug of this, there was a dramatically different answer. So in this case, mutations in the kinase domain were below the threshold of significance, and we can say, yes, they are related to the, to the sensitivity to the drug, and, and basically unrelated mutations in, in this other domain was sort of shifting it away and made basically drown the signal. We saw some other examples where, where for instance, genes uh, you know, again, the same thing. We can, we can look at separately a receptor domain in other regions and see that some connections, some relations were similar, uh, statistically significant, others were not. In other cases, we found examples where original genes were not found to be related, uh, not to be significant related to drug sensitivity because different domains were responsible for, for, for answers to different drugs. Again, when we separated them into domains, we could read these signals carefully. We had some other cases where the same gene and the same drug, but there was a different effect. A mutation in one domain was making it more sensitive, a domain in another domain was making it less sensitive. And again, there was a reason why the gene as a whole, when analyzed as a, as a whole unit, didn't give any signal. And in all these cases, we also did the full modeling of 3D structures, and we get some other information from there, but at this point, I just want to focus on this first step, where we actually just d divided cell into uh, proteins into domains. And what we also noticed is that we use domains which are known, the databases of domains, and a lot of domains in human genomes are not recognized. So a lot of proteins which seem not to have any domains, which doesn't mean that they don't, we just don't know them. So we made some effort in a, in a relative, re related project where we started to predict new domains in the human genome. And we, we, we have a database of these putative domains which nobody had proven, and we found for many of them 
again, we can see a difference, an actually significant correlation to, to drug sensitivity in this, this putative domains. Uh, even though officially they don't exist, but when we put them in into the picture, we can see that they differ from the neighbors in the, the pattern of, of responsiveness to drugs. Uh, so in summary, we believe that yes, three-dimensional structure information can bring new insights to understanding cellular networks. Uh, we just started working on, on, on one particular example of a network, which is a cancer network. We haven't really used all the three-dimensional information. We're doing it now. But we just use the information, the domains, that proteins are divided into domains. And we already got at this, in this simple experiment, we, did, we, we discovered about 170 new markers uh, correlating uh, response of drug cell, cell, cells to, to drugs. Uh, and there are also other disease networks. We are currently, for instance, working on a model of immune response to viral and bacterial pathogens using the same language. And if anybody has an interesting data set we can look at, we would be happy to try our new approach and see if we can see something which, which was missed in this normal approach. And uh, I don't think many people know what Sanford Brenner Medical Research Institute is. We, we have very famous neighbors, though. Uh, we are sort of nestled between UCSD, Salk, and Scripps, uh, all in this little square mile of, of research institutes in La Jolla, California, very close to the sea. Uh, which makes us sort of similar to Jeddah, but, but we're a little bit closer to the sea, so actually you can walk to the sea from there, and, and beach and surfing. And uh, we also have a um, graduate school in integrated biology. We actually apply, uh, accept applications, and January 14 is the next deadline. We have post postdoctoral positions available, so if anybody's interested, uh, let me know. And of course, acknowledgments. So the Tematoga work was done by Ying, Zhang, and Ines. Thielich, who's now a professor, um, uh, actually both have now uh, faculty positions. She's in, in Rhode Island, and she's in, in Reykjavik. Uh, domain biomarkers was done by Edward, and John Wen and Wukas are my modeling and fault assignment experts. And of course, more than half of this was work was done in Bernard Paulson's group at UCSD Systems Biology, and Roger was responsible for the E. coli project, and Ian and the, the JCSD team for all the structures and work on Tematagamaitina. And thank you very much. Thank you. 
genetics and, and other things. And so the, the sort of high level outline really is about having the right technology to do this because it is driven by technology fundamentally. But then you've got to do a lot more than just have the right technology. It's just like you know, computers with the Intel inside thing. If all you have is a computer chip that's the Intel inside, you'd be a long way from having the IT industry and IT capabilities we have, and that's the point. So I have a lot of slides, but let me try and go quickly. And I apologize for this sort of thing. <laughs> so this is just one personal aside, a little personal lesson. Um, I'm really a by scientific training a computational scientist, which means I make computer models of anything to try and accelerate our study of them by using computers instead of doing stuff in the lab, um, even though I did do a lot of stuff in the lab. And, and so the fun stuff I do is design computer algorithms for all sorts of stuff, but that's not the point. Over the last 23 years, I've mostly been at UCLA, and I spent the first half of that time working on nuclear fusion. <laughs> you know, in other words, what goes on in the sun, trying to make reactors that do that to make energy for the future of mankind. And it seems appropriate to mention that since Saudi is one of the major energy producing countries in the world. So I used to work on energy. And just for reference, that's a fusion reactor uh, uh, engineering design. That little tiny speck that you probably can't even see is, is a person, okay? <laughs> so the fusion reactor is several times larger than this auditorium. Now, I switched after about 12 years to working on genomics and uh, genetic disease. And really, if you uh, think about the, the reason it works much better, working on genomics and genetic disease, it's because the machines we need to make are small and the applications are big. You know, with energy, the application is big, but the machine is big too. And that, that slows the whole process down. With genomics, the application is big, you know, solving human disease. But the machines are very small. <laughs> and our latest machines fit in your fingers, essentially. So, that's the lesson I learned. Keep the big applications in mind, but make small machines. And, and so, another ingredient to my talk is just, you know, here's what's going on in terms of large national scale efforts to solve for the genetics of human disease. And this is a pretty good snapshot. The three with stars are the biggest, fully announced, fully funded efforts. And Genome England is the latest, that England plans to sequence 100,000 whole genomes, mainly for cancer, as part of their National Health Service. This will be done in the context of their National Health Care Program. Um, that was just announced. It's a $150 million five-year project. Um, th those numbers don't match up well, but that's what it is. <laughs> the other very big one that's out there is what's called the Million Veterans Program. The United States. This is an effort from the VA healthcare system, which is, is, a, is a little bit like the National Guard healthcare system here. It's the healthcare provider for veterans of the U.S. military. And it's actually the largest single healthcare provider in the U.S., amazingly enough. It, it covers 7 million patients with 150 hospitals around the country. And it is indeed the largest single healthcare system in the U.S. It's funded especially from the U.S. government uh, under the umbrella of sort of military funding. And they have a, a bold program, which is real, which is to take a million patients from their healthcare system, sequence their genomes, they have all their medical records, because they do their, their healthcare provision, and correlate their genome sequence with their healthcare status and outcomes, because they follow these people their whole lives. And to try and create from that the correlations between genes and disease and treatment that you need to really do personalized medicine. And they've just taken it upon themselves to do this for their healthcare system because they're the biggest in the US, they have a good stable funding source, and they're unique in having an electronic medical record system already and doing longitudinal care for people from 
the, basically their mid-20s through the rest of their life. So that's probably the biggest program in the world. Right this second, they've already biobanked DNA from 250,000 veterans. And just this year, just now, they've started the sequencing. Uh, they ordered 18,000 exomes to be sequenced in the coming nine months. And that's just the first task order towards doing at least 100,000 over the next five years. They really want to do the whole million. I mean, that's all contingent on funding, basically, but that's that. And the other, like, biggest program that's going on for real is what's called the NCATS program in the U.S. And so NCATS is going on. It's a little different. It's a relatively diffuse program. It's the evolution of all the academic research in the U.S., and they're trying to get away from the academic science to clinical science. And so it's really just the next way the U.S. is funding all this. It's $500 million. It's got four major sequencing centers. They do a lot of exome sequencing for disease genetics subsidized so the researchers can just send in their genome to get them sequenced and get the answers back. But uh, you know, those three with the stars are really the, the real big ones. They're for real, they're announced, they're fully funded. And then there's many other things going on, and there's many, many countries that are in stages of discussion and piloting of these things. And as part of my job, I, I sort of talk to a lot of these people, so that's why I know. Um, so, but here's the bigger question. This is a question that I'm trying to answer, is how do we move genomics out of the lab and into the world as quickly as possible to impact human health care and, and the management of disease? And, you know, because I'm an academic forever, it's very frustrating to be an academic because you can see how useful it is. You know, we got our first massively parallel sequencer in 2006, and they're pretty rare. And the first thing we did was sequence a cancer genome and convince ourselves that's a good thing to do. So it's been obvious for at least six or seven years that these new technologies just need to get out of the lab and into clinical use globally. And so how do you do that? How do you get there from here? <laughs> um, it's here, it's a great negative lab, but you want to be there where it's globally used in healthcare. And that's a challenge. So how to get there. So here's the master plan. I think to, to try and accelerate that, of course, you know, I don't want to be presumptuous. Everyone in the world is trying to do this, and everyone in this room and everywhere else is playing a role in this. I'm just asking the question, if one could control some large forces, which is never easy, if one could control some large forces, what would you do? And so one thing you do is get the right technology. I think the technologies we had circa 2007 8 were not quite right. They're a little too clunky to go out and globally do clinical sequencing, that is, millions of patients a year in a clinical setting. They were just not quite right for that. So you, you certainly got to get the right technology. And then if you want to accelerate this, you should, you should push where you can make the most impact. There's no point in pushing on things where you can't make impact. You've got to push where you can make impact. And it's, some countries are much better suited than others. In the U.S., it's important to make impact, but the problems in the U.S. are of a special nature. And then there's also just major genetics charities to be a great place to make impact. That is, global charities that work on genetic disease, because ultimately this is useful for resolving these diseases. And so these are the right targets. And the final thing is to do it the right way. And I, I personally believe the right way is not for people to organically do this themselves, but instead to have service providers do end-to-end -end solutions, as much end-to-end -end as is needed. And the analogy I like to give people is like if you look at nuclear power. If you want a nuclear power grid for your country, you don't call MIT and have them train some engineers and come build some nuclear power plants. If you call General Electric, and General Electric will build entire power plants for you. They'll grid them up into a power grid, and they'll help you manage them. And so, I believe genomics, although not quite as difficult as nuclear power, should be accelerated in this way so that it can just happen much faster. And, and then some people say, why do you care if it happens much faster? It's going to happen anyway. 
But you know, if you think about it in, in the personal sense, every single day that a test for your disease is not available is one more day someone gets that disease or, or is not diagnosed or dies from that disease. And so it's, it really matters at a personal level. And I'm sure a lot of you have, have relatives impacted by genetic disease. I, I have a number. And I think it's important to just push it as hard and as fast as possible because of that. So let me dance through these things quickly for you. I'll try. Uh, the right technology. Well, for what? I mean, the right technology for global scale meaning millions of patients, clinical, meaning it's in a very controlled environment, and genome sequencing, but I don't care whether it's exomes or whole genomes, but certainly that scale. So the right technology, well, the way it should work, <laughs> you know, the way sequencing should work is it should lay out a piece of DNA and some sort of nano probe should read along the thing and just read it for us. Unfortunately, this is really, really, really when you take the nanoprobes that are available, there is scanning, tunneling microscopes, and try this, you do not get enough resolution to see DNA sequence. Even the state-of-the-art things are extremely limited. So that's not the right way. <laughs> so the reason I left academia in terms of my, my, most of my time and went into industry was to go to Life Technologies, which is the major provider of sort of tools in life sciences. Tools meaning everything, all the lab instruments, all the lab reagents, everything. They're a huge company. What mattered to me is they spend 400 million a year on R&D on these sort of things. And I wanted to access that. And the way I explained to my mom how big they are is that they're the biggest FedEx customer in the world. <laughs> okay, so they ship stuff to so many labs, 75,000 labs around the world. And they're the merger of applied biosystems, which historically made the DNA sequencers. And in Petrogen, which made everything else you can run a lab. And those of you who pay attention probably know they're just about to merge into Thermo Fisher in about a month. And the combined thing will be the largest provider of scientific tools in the world. And will be even better positioned to do good things. And so I joined them to lead a program to find the ultimate DNA sequencer. They, it's a long story as why they were dumb enough to ask me to do this, but they did. And so the original conception is some sort of nano device that begin with read DNA and that would be the right technology. Now, it turns out this is, this is to this moment exceedingly difficult to do and no one can do it in a way that has any relevance to sequencing in at least the next five years. So instead, I got smart and we ended up searching globally for the right technology, the right one I said, and we just happened to find one several, but we found one that was especially well suited, and we bought it. I, I talked the company into spending almost a billion dollars to buy this technology, which is a chip-based DNA sequencing technology, the very first and only such ever. And, you know, the, because it's chip-based is why it was the right thing. I mean, basically, it reduced the entire sequencer, all the important parts of it, the sensing and measuring, to an actual computer chip that does chemical sensing to an array of sensors. And the point is, it's a very manufacturable way to do it. You could mass manufacture these precision devices on the scale you would need for global work, millions of patients, and the precision you would need, because they're made with the precision of computer chips, for the clinical industry. So we did that. Now, I, I can't help but say one thing about the inventor, Jonathan Rothberg, <laughs> who I made a millionaire. Um, <laughs> But uh, he's an interesting guy. He invented the 454 sequencer, for those of you who know your sequencing history. He invented the first, you know, he introduced this massively parallel sequencing, and then he took a break, and when he took a break, um, he, uh, he made a copy of Stonehenge. <laughs> That's a life-size copy of Stonehenge in his backyard. And during that year, he conceived of this technology, and then started this company. And the whole reason we did it is because it has the potential to do a thousand dollar three hour genome. Um, it's fulfilling that potential right now, and that, that chip that will do that has almost a billion sensors will be coming out, you know, end of the year, first quarter next year. But that's the reason that technology, bottom line, is so correct. In a little instrument that looks a lot like any other sort of clinical instrument, you can get to the point of having a, a three hour whole genome, 
and some of it can be sold for $1,000, and that's well on its way. And, you know, it's a, it's a digital sensor chip. Much like the sensor chips in digital cameras, it's a chemical sensor chip. So instead of an array of light sensors that are pixels, it has an array of chemical sensors, and these are used in a very clever way to read sequencing information. Um, rather than go long on it, here's a great paper, which I happen to write, here's a great paper that goes extremely deep on this technology, deeper than anyone has ever gone. Um, I know that, uh, here's how you know it's a good paper. Uh, the head of our legal counsel yelled at me and cursed at me for half an hour after the paper. <laughs> so, you know, it's got true things in it. Um, <laughs> but it lays out both the, all the technology and the, actually the entire platform, every other aspect, not just the chip, but the instrument, the sample prep, the analysis, everything. And just to, to show you how much effort goes into it, this is the author list which is everyone involved in the R&D, which is over 310 people, uh, it's, that's how many people it takes to develop a technology like this. So, I think that's the right technology. I claim now, someone say, wait, aren't nanopores the future? I keep hearing that nanopores are the future. And I think it's worthy of, of our Nobel laureate from yesterday to know that nanopore sequencing is literally the evolution of patch plant. It's, it's that fundamental scientific technique applied to a measurement problem, because sort of patch clamping of ion channels is how nanopore sequencing works. And, you know, this is a very promising concept. Unfortunately, it's been promising for 20 years, uh, and will maybe continue to be promising for another 20 years. It's very difficult. Uh, I think, you know, it's making progress, but it's not in the right time frame for what we need, which is the next five years. Um, and then one other technology thing that, that goes with it, which I just mentioned for the sheer glory of it, is we've introduced a, a capture technique if you only want to sequence the exome, only want to sequence the coding regions. We introduced an all PCR capture technique to go with the sequencing platform. You can think about that all PCR, so you're capturing 300,000 exonic amplicons with multiplex PCR, and it works to the scale of multiplexing. We get 24,000 PCR reactions in one tube. I've visualized here. That's 24,000 24, wells in a single place in one tube. So with this massively multiplex PCR technology, we can capture the exome in PCR world terms. You know, three hours of PCR, and we've captured it as, as PCR amplicons. And then you throw it on the sequencer and sequence it. So that's a good solution for genomes and exomes. So that's why the technology is right. Whether it's exomes or genomes, you got that part solved. Um, I, I always get people asking me about the $1,000 genome, so I'm going to make one comment on the $1,000 genome, which is just who's $1,000, you know? The whole $1,000 number is meaningless at this point, because if you think about how you actually make the reagents to do the sequencing of the chip as well, there's like raw materials like silicon and water and, and, and organic chemicals. You know, you do things with those and there's a markup. Then we build instruments and kits, and there's a markup. And then we sell them to some core lab at a major university or hospital, and there's a markup. And then some physician interprets the results, and there's another markup. And so, you know, where the thousand dollars is is sort of a, sort of not the key thing, <laughs> because it's just a moving thing in there, and it, it, you know, it's sliding around right now. Really, it's about where I show it is. So. You know, back to the master plan, I really want to focus on one part of the master plan. You definitely need to go to the countries that are ready. And ready means they have a disease burden, they have the dollars to pay, and they have a social structure that could do something with that, such as screening, such as, say, Saudi has pre marital screening. That's the right social structure to make use of this type of information. So, I want to focus, though, on, on the you know, I think anyone can realize that. I want to focus the last minute or two on just what I think is the right way to do it. The right approach. You know, which, which is to have, you know, here's what has to happen. If you think about a population disease, you have to biobank. You have to do a whole bunch of sequencing. You have to do a whole bunch of analysis and disease gene hunting. You have to do a whole bunch of validation procedures cellular validations or model organisms or some sort of cohort study, so lots of validation.
comes in the form of, just like GE will assist you with nuclear power, you need someone to assist you with doing all that stuff. Whether it's setting up all the sequencing labs at scale, whether it's the disease gene honey part, the disease gene validation part, or the ultimate some sort of sort of population level redeployment of diagnostics. And that's what I created in life now. So A, I got the right technology. B, I've been creating a team that does this. It's just to fill all the gaps. Some people have more gaps than others, and the gaps live in different places. But the whole point is, you just want to fill people's gaps. Because like GE will do for, for nuclear power, IBM will do this for cell telephone networks. If you're a country, you can call IBM and say, I need a cell telephone network. They'll come make it. I think the same thing needs to be there for genomic medicine. And we do that. And among other things, we won, <laughs> we have to be the one who won the service contract for the Million Veterans Program in the US, which is the largest sequencing contract ever given. And we partnered with Lockheed Martin for various reasons, because we need a big IT provider partner, and Lockheed Martin fills that role for us. And so, I think just, this is the final slide, <laughs> condensed. Getting the right technology is very important. You've got to have something that is mass manufacturable and computer-like to push out to clinics all over the world. And then you have to, you know, focus your effort on the right targets, the right countries, and, and especially the Arab countries, you're not getting the right ones for various reasons I think people understand, and a few others. But you've got to focus your effort and where you're going to deploy and then you have to have the right approach to that deployment, which is end-to-end -end enterprise solutions. So that people just don't have to develop organic capability. People can actually just request to have this infrastructure created. And you know, it's going on. And the Million Veterans Program is just one interesting example. But all I will say about it, <laughs> this last slide, is that you know, the right technology, in fact, it's a computer chip that is the sequencer. That's what you need. Um, the right diseases turn out to be rare recessive diseases because we know how to use the, the technology to find the cause there. The right countries, the Arab countries have many positive attributes for this. And the right approach is sort of end-to-end -end solutions. And, and you know, the only problem with doing this work <laughs> is it's what I call advancing developments. Because <laughs> you're dealing with large, powerful things like corporations and governments and billionaires and kings and things. And you know, you think you're getting them to do something, but they, they do whatever they want. They will crush you <laughs> whenever they want to. And the real major barrier is in practice, once you have some right country to do this in, is dollars to start, a way to show immediate utility so the dollars don't dry up, and a stable financial and political support to keep these efforts going for five or so years so they can really deliver on the full promise of what it takes. So that's a, that's a highly condensed uh, delivery, but the whole point is again just to try and <laughs> wield some very powerful forces.